Um, I have a video of Michael Irving that was... Shit. Fuck. Damn. Oh. That hurt. <laughs> Here we go. Damn. Fucking wind. Ow. Well, good morning, good people. Mark Holmes here, of course, with Joe Boo is at the Red Brick House. But we got Joe Bear holding it down for us. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. I hope everybody's having a great Thirsty Thursday. Man, you know, it sucks because we are in the red tide the dead zone there ain't nothing going on it's just the bullshit time right now and i get it everybody is trying to get something to talk about and everything else and i'm realizing that what they need to do with the espns the fox sports ones the pro football talks and all that stuff is they need to put a label on them like you got for cigarettes that says for entertainment purposes only because you don't really if you're really looking for facts and things so you can make your own judgment it doesn't exist it doesn't exist it's sometimes it feels like it's just made up shit and we're just going to throw it up there for a reaction and i get it you know you got guys like mike farello who's literally complaining about ai is becoming clickbait is he jealous? Because Lord knows you clickbaited the hell out of everybody with your whole Des Bryant that there might be a tape out there five times worse than Ray Rice that literally started off a whole firestorm. Still haven't seen that tape yet. And so right now, things are done for reactions to get you to click, watch, and so on, or read the articles. So the flavor in the ear, okay, well, let, let's, let's go back a little bit here. You know how when you go to one of these famous places, eat places, like there's a hot dog place that's in Detroit, there's Pink's out in California, you know, there's uh, Pat and Gino's uh, in Philly. You know, you go there and they're famous for being famous. They've been around for so long that everybody's, it's iconic. People have seen it. They've taken pictures there. And you want to say, oh my God, I've seen this on dives and eats and all this, that, and the other. I want to go, I got to go there. Oh, and, and of course, because you're going there, it's an icon. You, you get the hot dog or you get the chili or what, you know, Ben's chili bowls. And you're like, ah, I got it and everything else. And you share it. But if you're honest with yourself, the food is usually not good. It's not good. It's famous for being famous. People in Philadelphia will tell you Pat and Gino's cheesesteak is ass ass. They don't go there. About the only place I've ever been to that literally was as good as advertised is Mama's. It's Mama's or Mother's in New Orleans. Now, we went there, me and Mike, with Joe Boo. Joe Boo got bitch slapped by the nice old lady who worked there and said, how dare you bring Cowboys voodoo to New Orleans? But the food, that <laughs> was some good food. And much the same with football players. You know, like when we got Don Terry Poe. Oh, my God, I was thinking, Don Terry Poe, big guy. He's been decent in the league at clogging up the middle. Gerald McCoy, the things that he did. He's excited about playing, you know, like on Thanksgiving and stuff in front of his family and things. And you think about the things that they've done in the past. They're famous for being famous. But the reality is, is it's not real good. And we keep getting recycled all these things because we know we're, we're very thin on the roster. We look at it and we say, we got Zeke Elliott. You know, oh my God, Zeke. You know, Zeke last year, man, he wasn't that great, even though he was on a bad team with a terrible offensive line and no passing game. We look and we say, we got to replace him. And I'm not going to say that that's not a, a bad idea to look to, to upgrade at any position. You know, um, Dan Salio pointed out, he said, maybe you look at a Dalvin Cook. You know, Dalvin Cook last year was terrible, but he only had, you know, 40 carries or whatever with the Jets on a bad team. 
that you know the year before he played great okay i could i could say that that would be a possibility right there but here we now have the leonard fournette oh my god the cowboys need to go get leonard fournette because in your mind, you're remembering Leonard Fournette that won the Super Bowl with Tom Brady. Oh, man. Let's, oh, let's go get Leonard. Uh, hey, Cowboys should be interested. Leonard Fournette, he wants to continue his career. But I'm here to tell you that, are you serious? Because I want you to understand, Leonard Fournette last year was on Buffalo's roster had 40 carries, 3.3 yards a carry. That's it. The year before, he was on Tampa Bay. He did have 668 yards, 3.5 yards a carry. And that was with Tom Brady and the offense being able to pass. In fact, Leonard Fournette, is a career 3.9 yard per carry average guy. Only two seasons of his whole career was he average more than four yards a carry, only two. And so you look at this and say, we're talking about taking a running back that people say may be washed up and bringing in one that's even more washed up. That's the idea, that's the solution for the Cowboys, seriously? <laughs> How about if the Cowboys hadn't traded for Trey Lance and took the fourth round pick that we had in the draft and drafted a running back? That, but then again, that makes too much sense. But be that as it may, it's not going to change. We are where we are. But sorry, people, Leonard Fournette is not the answer. And back to the whole concept of it should be only for entertainment purposes only. Because I woke up this morning, thank the Lord for, for that. Um, and I'm listening to a clip from Colin Cowherd. And it brought back some deja vu of a month ago where him and Nick Wright were having a pick of quarterbacks where they were going through and ranking them one through 16. Let's go back to that for a second here, okay? Let's listen to it. Next five years, how, what, what's the parameters? L let's say it's right now, it doesn't, even the timeline. You're a general manager, so you have to come up with a timeline. Okay, all right. But I'm a GM. Everything counts. We're both GMs. Okay, I'll give you first because you want Mahomes. Yeah, yeah yes, I do. Thank you. I appreciate okay. that. I'll go Josh Allen. All right, if I'm being honest, my next pick is Caleb. Okay. And I know he would have been available at later, but I couldn't <laughs> risk not getting him. I know what a I, terrible I, got, I understand. I understand that that is he would have been available later, but I, but okay. I, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'll take Lamar Jackson, number four. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, then I feel it great because this is the guy I would have taken next. I will take CJ. Okay. Now, just on value proposition, although I worry about his injuries, I'll take Joe Burrow at six. Yeah, I'm worried about those injuries, buddy. I agree with you. I um, So there's a guy that you and I would both, only because I know you love him so much, I might want him, but I'm not. I just, I, I'm sorry. I'm going through the league quickly here. Mm -hmm. All right. This is there's this is not this does not make sense from a value perspective timeline, but I'm trying to win right this GM is on the hot seat and he's trying to win right now. <laughs> uh, I'm taking Matt Stafford. By the way, I, I I absolutely love Matt Stafford. I know you do. That I, that's why I was worried. I was like, you're gonna swoop in and get him. Yeah, so because of that, I'll take Justin Herbert eight. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, that's all right, that's good. I'll take Trevor. Okay. Okay, hold on. I'm going to take Jordan Love. Oh, that's a good pick. That's a good so now we have 11 you. and 12. <laughs> I got to tell you, Jordan Love's a good pick. All right, now I got to think. I'm just going through, like, in my head, the divisions. All right. Well, no. How many picks are we doing? We do 16? So, yeah, you have Mahomes, me, Allen. You, Caleb, me, Lamar. You, yeah. CJ Stroud, me, Burrow. You, Stafford. I'm on Herbert. You, Trevor, me, Jordan, love, you're 11. Yep. 
All right. I'm I'm not. We'll go to uh, 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 no, okay. hold on. Let's go to 16. Let's just go. Uh, to let's 16. go to 16. We each get okay. three more picks. I'm just okay. making sure that I'm not leaving out any obvious teams. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. I am. All right, I'm going to, this is going to be, this, again, this guy was going to be available later, but now I'm going upside. I'm going to take, with the 11th pick of the draft, <laughs> Anthony Richardson. Uh-huh. Well, I, yeah, he, I get it. I like him. I'm He's gonna a, take, in the top five pick, whatever, yeah. Okay. I'm going to take Jared Goff, 12. I knew you would. I could have okay. taken Goff and just held him ransom on you mm -hmm. and made you trade me a bounty. <laughs> Okay. Um, but I didn't want to okay. do it. All right. Now, all right. At this point mm -hmm. in the draft. I know who I, I'm taking at 14. Well, unless I take him first. At this point in the draft, I am now comfortable taking Jalen Hurts. Oh, Jesus. I'll take Kyler Murray. I got Kyler Murray at 14. I feel I, like I fucking You love stole Kyler. Him. I know you I think do. he's so talented. I listen. Kyler Murray, it's a six Seriously? foot and under league, you got to steal. Kyler, um, we got we got no Dak. Um, we got Kyler he, Murray okay. at number fifteen. This is the last pick I'm gonna have, and this is gonna shock people. But again, it's my last pick. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'll shoot the moon on it. I I I mean I don't know. I. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. I don't love it, and I do feel like he could be a pain in the ass in the locker room, but I'm going to take Aaron Rodgers. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take Jaden Daniels. Jaden wow. Daniels. Dak, undrafted. Wow. So the un our undrafted guys, Tua, Her cousins. undrafted. Dak, Her cousin. Un All right, so... I'm not going to say that that list is right or wrong. That is your personal preference. Get it. No problem. So then when I heard this this morning, that's where it brought me back to that. Because he was ranking, Colin Coward was ranking quarterback and coach combinations for the NFL. So if Dak Prescott is not part of your top 16, there's no way in the world that they, he could be part of your top 10 coach quarterback combinations, unless you're saying that Mike McCarthy's a genius. So let's listen to this real quick. My top 10, if I gave you a top 10 AFC, NFC quarterback combination, mm -hmm. the first one's an easy one. That's Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. Can't, can't highest win percentage by any quarterback coach combo in the Super Bowl era. That's an easy one. He's mm -hmm. the great play designer, a clever play caller, and Mahomes right now is the most gifted quarterback potentially ever, but certainly playing right now. Uh, number two, I'd go McVay and Matt Stafford. I think Matt Stafford, because of his years in Detroit, was overlooked. A Next to Mahomes, maybe the best arm talent in the league. Sidearm, does everything but throw it left-handed. Big over-the-top arm. I think McVay may be the smartest coach, period, in the sport. I'd put him at two. I'd go John Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson three. Bottom line is they've won 10 plus games and reached the playoffs in five or six years. Listen, Lamar is different, and you're going to have a different it's hard to, okay, with him. No, no, I'm not disagreeing with I mean, you. You can change this order games, a little bit, especially it's, it's, in the AFC conceivable. North to be that good perpetually. I'd put them third. I'd put Jim Harbaugh and Justin Herbert fourth. Now, a little bit of that is a projection. I think Herbert's a remarkable talent, and there's an argument to be made college and pro jim harbaugh is the best coach on the planet so i would put them fourth in the coach quarterback combo i would put sean mcdermott josh allen fifth and i think we all know josh is probably even more so than mahomes just physically on a different planet okay Size, not disagreeing with any of this speed arm strength there's just nothing like josh allen in the world including mahomes I think the misgivings we have sometimes, defensive coaches in big playoff games against offensive coaches, we worry about. But they've got four straight division titles. They're obviously a very good football organization. So I would say four of the top five are AFC. Okay, so that right off the top, mm -hmm. once again, it's the AFC. You can you can argue about the order yeah, after we can agree Mahomes, with that. certainly. 
I would go to the next five, and I start with another AFC team, uh, Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow. Now, listen, Bengals have reached at least the AFC championship in any year Joe Burrow's been healthy. Now, I do believe he is one injury away from real adult conversations on mm-hmm. looking to draft another quarterback at some point, maybe not a okay. first-round pick. But um, now this is his first year without offensive uh, coordinator Brian Callahan, who's the Titans head coach, so that'll be a little interesting. Uh, then, starting at number seven, I feel like the NFC teams are on the come. Matt LaFleur, okay. Jordan Love would be number seven. So I'd like to see a little NFC bit more team. of Jordan Love, but the last ten games of the year, the kid was on fire. And I'll give Matt LaFleur a lot of credit. When okay. Aaron Rodgers was there, I felt like it was Aaron's offense and Aaron's team. I thought last year uh, Matt LaFleur could really flex. I thought he was really clever. I loved his game plans. Um, I loved his alterations at half. I thought Matt LaFleur really established himself as a top five, six coach in the league. Number eight, Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott. Whoa, Listen, they've whoa, won 12 whoa. games each of the last three seasons. Nobody else in the league has done that. Uh, McCarthy's a good, solid coach. Dak's a solid. You can argue they're both B plus, but that gives you number eight in the NFL. We just we want more in January. Okay. All right. So here's my thing. Hold on. If you literally take Kyler Murray and Justin Herbert and Trevor Lawrence and all these guys and and rookies that haven't even played in the NFL ahead of Dak Prescott, how is it now you have? Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy over, like, Brock Purdy and crew and Shanahan. How is that? How is that you have them over, you know, Jalen Hurts and, you know, uh, Kellen Moore and so on? I'm trying to understand how it is. Now, now you say he's a B plus. So are you saying that Kyler Murray and Justin Herbert and, uh, you know, some of the uh, Trevor Lawrence, that those guys are A's? I'm just saying that pick a side. Pick a side. Either Dak Prescott sucks and he's not top 16. If you're not top 16, how can you be eighth, third in the NFC? Same guy. That's all I'm saying. For entertainment purposes only. Now, we're going to get out of here. We're going to close on this one. Warren Sharp, okay. Warren Sharp, founder of Sharp Football Statistics and Sharp Football Analysis has determined that the Dallas Cowboys will regress next season. You know, if you're a betting man, a team that's won 12 games three years in a row, the reality is, is in the NFL that constantly turns over, where you can go from worst to first and first to worst real quickly, that the odds are that you probably won't win more than 12 games again. It's a safer bet to say, oh, they're probably going to regress, when you look and say they didn't do anything to upgrade their roster like other teams. They now have a first-place schedule, which means they're going to be playing tougher games. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But let's listen in to what Warren Sharp on Rich Eisen's show had to say about it. A little tough. Is that what you say when this thing finally uh, get, comes out? I mean, how many pages is this bad boy, this beast? 559 pages this year, uh, which is the longest in a little pages. while. But wow. uh, there's, you know, 15 to 16 pages on every single team. And uh, it's really a labor of love. Once once I'm done with it, I get to do shows like yours and, and I get to go talk to people about football. It's a lot more fun and entertaining than it is sitting in my office here, uh, slaving away till 3 a.m. like I've been doing uh pretty much seven days a week for the last several months. Yeah, I was about to say, when do you start previewing? When, I mean, when when is a good time to actually preview an NFL season knowing how long it takes to build a team? Yeah, I start in March. Um, it's a slow build. Uh, it gets really crazy after the NFL draft and then the schedules are announced. Um, but it's, it's a process. Um, as these teams are changing, in order to kind of predict the future, you have to really understand the past. And so that's why I get a lot of work done in March and April studying what these teams were. Um, I don't buy into that. What is it? The, the, the Bill Parcellsism, you are what your record says you are. You know, everybody's record uh, it can be defined by, you know, one score wins and losses or lucky turnovers or a couple of field goals that were made that, that might have been missed in, in other years. Um, and so I try to get rid of all the luck factors that go into teams and just get a better understanding as to 
who they were, what has changed since last season, coaches, players, et cetera, who they've been drafted, what their schedule looks like, and then who they're going to play this year and how those teams have changed. And uh, so it, it definitely takes a lot of time. Um, but if you're not thorough in the process and if you don't take time along the way, every step of the way, mm-hmm. you're going to miss some things that might end up proving quite valuable in, you know, oh, this is, this is actually why this team came uh, out of – perceivingly nowhere uh and nobody was expecting it or wow this team actually wasn't as good as the record was uh last year i guess because they're really struggling this upcoming season so there's a lot of that that you got to really take into consideration so how long uh did you hold off on doing your dallas cowboys preview because you thought they had to add somebody in free agency and then you just stuck around and then you're all right i might as well start digging on the cowboys how long did that take you yeah the- <laughs> there, there were a few teams like that. Um, the, the San Francisco 49ers were actually the last team that I did because I wasn't sure what might happen with Brandon Ayuk. Mm-hmm. Um, the Dallas Cowboys, I also waited for a little while just seeing what they might do. Obviously, if there's any you know big quarterback deals or decisions that get made that really alter some things, and there were some rewrites that we had to do um, along the way. But you know, for the Cowboys, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, they are a very thin roster and they have had a lot of luck thanks to turnovers over the last three years in fact they're i think one of 10 teams over the last two decades that have been plus 10 or better in turnover margin for three consecutive years and the average of those other teams that have done that prior they only get plus four turnovers the next year, which would be the 2024 season for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, And as I'm sure you know, turnovers make a colossal impact on the end result of games. I mean, turnover margin ends up dictating the way that the vast majority of games go. And not only is it probably time for them to not have as much luck on the turnover side of things, but also they lost their defensive coordinator to the Washington Commanders head coach and Dan Quinn. He brought with him some assistance, uh, and that's going to change a lot as it relates to their defense and potentially their ability to ball hawk. I want to say they got six non-offensive touchdowns last season. These are touchdowns when their offense isn't even on the field. Most of them came from returning fumbles, returning interceptions, but there was a couple of uh, punt or kick returns as well. So you know, th- this is just a team that I think has a relatively thin roster. Um They've, they, they don't know what they want to do at quarterback long term, and uh, some of this luck might go against them this season. So they're a team that I think definitely is, is ready to regress a little bit from mm. where they were last season. Again, all 32 teams have chapters, predictions, projections, analysis, you know, much more. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that you needed 15 or 16 pages to kind of get that analysis with the Cowboys. We all we all know that the Cowboys have always been top heavy when it comes to their roster. I mean, you can go back to when we lost Sean Lee where we were holding teams to about 85 yards uh per rushing per game that went into 180 after he got hurt. You can look at it and say every time we've lost Tyron Smith, you know, and we replace him with the Chaz Green that we are thin at roster. That has been the biggest problem for the Cowboys is generally speaking we have great talent across the board that if they were to stay healthy and 100 percent through the season you'd win the super bowl every year the problem is and this is the knock that's on the cowboy well you had so many pro bowlers and so many all pros well part of that is a popularity contest let's be honest with you if you're on the Dallas Cowboys, when it comes to Pro Bowl and all that, everybody goes through. Make sure you vote and everybody else is posting it on Twitter and everything else. And Cowboys are going to get more love than if you are a Tennessee Titan or if you're a New York Jet or if you're a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. The thing is, is you have all of these Pro Bowlers, which are great. But if you lose a Tyron Smith, if you have a Zeke Elliott who's got a hyperextended knee, if you end up losing a Diggs with an ACL, or you don't have a linebacker on the roster because you're so top-heavy, you're not going to win in football. You're not going to win. And this is where it's truly the team where you have to say, you know what, maybe we don't have the top-tier guy here, but we've got two or three guys that can play that role that we can rotate, keep fresh in there. 
And that, my friends, is the difference between the Cowboys going deep in the playoffs is they won't fill spots. We do this position flex where we believe, oh, it's okay because this guy's got to play two roles. Listen, when I need a nose guard, I want a guy who that's all he does. He knows how to clog the middle of the field. I don't want a guy who's also a defensive tackle. It's not the same thing. And unfortunately, Stephen Jones has it in his head that it is. All right, good people. I hope you all are going to have a great day. I appreciate you guys as always, and I will see you.